I think if you look at the way people work, it is still very much rooted in a paper tradition. So uh, the mobile phone is probably the most dramatic technology that we've got because it represents the internet. So it has to change everything. The internet changes everything is what Mr. Gates said. But remember, Mr. Gates also said that IT will make an efficient company more efficient, but it'll also make an inefficient company more inefficient. Within Philips, we're a firm believer that it's not technology for technology's sake. Um, but clearly, technology has a key role as, a, as an enabler. Um, and when you look at the Nicholson challenge, we believe that um, that challenge can only be met by the appropriate use of technology. But again, very clearly, as an enabler for different services. I think from our discussions with clinicians, what we've tried to do is ensure that what we're doing is valid for the patient, meaningful for the patient, and the, clin the clinician thinks it's going to improve healthcare. And an example is we went to see one clinician who was involved in gastroenterology. And he said, I'm seeing 90 patients a week in my clinic. 10 of them need to be seen. I have no idea how I can check the other ones. So I'm seeing, what, 80 patients. But I only need, uh, not 80 or 90 patients, I need to see 10. And he said to us, if you could provide me information on their status, I would then know which 10 to bring in. We're interrupting their daily life, days off work, days off school, and it's filling up my clinic with people who I just almost like eyeball and then they go home. And if I could have had a monitoring system that's discreet and fits in with the patient's life, they wouldn't be inconvenienced and I could spend more time on the 10 I needed to see. I'm very interested in the, the carbon footprint of the NHS and we have to reduce the carbon footprint of the NHS and 20% of carbon footprint is staff and patient travel. Now we have to ask ourselves how much of that is of low value or negligible value. And particularly patient travel. There's a lovely phrase called the burden of treatment in which uh, patients have to put up with a lot. So I think a lot of this movement that we do is, is unnecessary and unproductive. While at the same time in many parts of the country it's still impossible for GPs to phone a consultant and get an opinion. So they have to send the patient um, to an outpatient clinic. So I think it has a very significant impact on, on staff and patient travel, for the better. I think some of the oncology work we've been carrying out, um, sometimes a patient will have to go to hospital if they've got an adverse event to the chemotherapy for antibiotics or the growth factors or the like. And I'm not saying we're gonna put a hospital in the patient's kitchen, but what oncologists have told us is that if we had monitoring of the patients in the home, they may have been sent home with some antibiotics and they may be following monitoring of the patient, say, now take the antibiotics we've given you. So the whole care process has been encapsulated in the patient's home under the full guidance, governance and management of the clinician. So it means the patient doesn't have to go to hospital, so the hospital is dealing with acute care, planned care, um, program care. The strength of the technology that we use for the virtual wards and the predictive modelling technology that we use, the strength is in that the technology helps us identify the patients so it's, it uh, removes all subjectivity, so a really good starting point, key to, to identifying the right patients. But the strength of the virtual wards and what, what makes them work is getting all the people in the room together discussing the care of that patient. And whilst we call it virtual ward, it's virtual because the patient isn't there, the patient doesn't need to get dragged out of their home to be discussed. But I think if we went too virtual and used too much technology and had those, sort of, uh, those people dialing in through teleconference, for example, you wouldn't have that strength. The real strength is the people and the relationships. In the modern health service, the, uh, the patient is the only one who's constant. Everyone else is uh, shift work, nine to five, evening shifts, part-time. And uh, in, as more and more people get involved in healthcare, the patient is the only one who's constant. So the simplest thing, uh, it's probably, you could say it's morally the right thing to do, but the simplest way to run healthcare is to put the patient at the center. And that would mean that the patient could hold their information on their mobile phone. I, th I think one of the concerns that we hear from many patients is they feel rushed when they're seeing a doctor that seven minute, whatever, interview time, consult time. And I think one of the areas that um, technology can help is, is like with predictive modeling, 
um, giving a patient feedback on, you've had this done to you, you'll have, you've had this drug, you've had this procedure, and the likely things that you'll, occur, uh, that, that will, uh, you'll experience over the next few days will be stiffness of joints, um, um, kind of dizziness, um, you know, vomiting, whatever it is. And that's, that's, that's likely to happen, we expect it to happen, and so don't worry. So it's almost like reassuring the patient, because some patients then are phoning the doctor all the time, wasting clinical time, in quotes, or not calling but getting very, very, very stressed. One of the things for us as a business um, that we're trying to get our head around at the moment um, is the fact that yes, we're prepared to invest, we're prepared to make those investments in the future um, of, of healthcare in the UK. Um, but with any investment comes the need to be clear about when does the return come back on that investment. Um, and one of the challenges that we have at the moment is just being clear about what does the future look like so we can start to model that return on investment. And that's key for us clearly as a commercial organisation. I think we have to uh, be clear that uh, we need to move away from institutional based healthcare as our only way of thinking. Why is it we know that it is pound what we spend every hospital and, and health centre, not that it is 100 million what we spend on bipolar disorder or epilepsy or rheumatoid arthritis? Now you have to have bureaucracies for the fair and open employment of people and the uncorrupt management of money. But healthcare is too complex for bureaucracies or markets to deal with. We need complex adaptive systems. So uh, for the future, I would see, it could be a matrix, but it's actually a bit more messy than that. So we'd have a set of CCGs, DHAs, who knows what they'll be called in three years' time. So we've a set of those, but we've also a set of population-based systems. There are 30 big programs at the level of respiratory disease, cancer, frail elderly people. And in each of those, there's usually three or four big systems, like within respiratory, there's asthma, and chronic bronchitis, and sleep apnea. In my view, there's about 100 big problems, and they all need population-based systems. And uh, these would be a new approach to healthcare we're calling population-based and personalized. So we don't go only to population. We need to remember that in the world of the mobile phone, Individuals are increasingly looking for a customised or personalised service, just like you can choose the colour of your mini before it's made. That's customisation and personalisation. So we're entering a new paradigm. We're leaving quality and safety and effectiveness behind us in that we just expe expect those. But the new paradigm is the 2P paradigm, population and personalised healthcare.